Bienvenue. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Tech Speakering Workshop Series. For people in attendance, I'm sorry. I mean, I guess I can sit, but okay, I'll do that. That's better. Okay, thank you everyone for coming to the series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a, I'm a professor here at the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Tech Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersection computer science, communication, Q studies, disability studies, history, and critical race theory. I'm so excited to welcome you all, those of you who are in person, and also for those of you online, welcome. So some notes on accessibility. As is the case with all of our hybrid and virtual events, we have cart captioning in English. So people in the I know it's a bit small, but you can also follow on your device. And for people on Zoom, you can turn your captions on at the bottom of your screen. Thank you today for our captioner, Sarah. Today, today it's not tonight. Tonight, we have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you may type your questions in the question answer box at the bottom of and we'll have time at the end for Dr. Sasha Lucioni to answer them. Uh, for folks who are in the room, of course, you can raise your hand during the Q&A period um, and we'll repeat the question also so it's on Zoom. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered. Coming up this semester, our next event is on February 7th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Tawana Petty will speak about in pursuit of data justice when opting out becomes improbable. It's a virtual event on February 13th um, at 6 p.m. in virtual format. Dr. Brianna Clark Gray will, Brenna Clark Gray, excuse me, technology with somebody's choice, resisting inevitability discourses and recognizing power in the generative AI revolution. And a scare quotes there. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. That's the redirect URL, disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Rakath, and more. So as we welcome you into our homes and our offices or in the space of the IGSF through Zoom and you welcome us into yours, let us be mindful of space and place. So past series speakers, Suzanne Kite, into the physical and material impacts of the digital world. The topic of the environmental cost of digital technologies will also be addressed this semester I think of it at least a lot in today's event and other upcoming events, including the one with Mel Hogan. While many of the events this semester are virtual and or hybrid, every land and the space that we are on, we must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on. Indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted by mining practices used for materials that are used to build our computers and our digital infrastructure. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisible in Canada's long colonial history, this is the series, as I mentioned, USF of McGill University. McGill is located in Jojoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by Indigenous protectors and people involved in land the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money that he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in the space we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a useful resource for beginning. I also want to welcome the students of Dr. Tracy Valcourt's Technology and Power and Art History at Concordia class for attending today's event. So, hi. Thanks, students. <laughs> okay. Dr. Sasha Guccioni is a researcher in ethical and sustainable artificial intelligence at Hugging Face, as well as a founding member of Climate Change AI and a board member of Women in Machine Learning. Dr. Guccioni's work focuses on having a better understanding of the social impacts of AI models, data, so for folks in the room and folks online, please join me and welcome me and Dr. Sasha Lucioni. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna just hide this camera. 
<laughs> um, hi, everyone, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, so oh, there you go. Never mind. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to skip this slide, uh, but I'll start with this one. So often I think that people perceive um, rightfully perceive tech um, at odds uh, with the environment, extractive practices that are are perpetuated is no exception and often there is um there's tension so in a lot of the events i go to um both sometimes it's like well ai doesn't really have a climate impact it's ethereal it doesn't really have a tangible material um you know uh, or, or form whereas other people ai is really bad for the planet it it's something that we should you know really really be aware of and i mean both are true um and i think that what i try to get to in my research is is awareness and being aware of both the positive and the negative impacts um, and to make informed choices because it's all approach to to tech in general so it's really a question of having all the necessary information to make the choices that um, you know every person user creator deployer of AI technologies has to make and so I'll start with the positive I'll start with the good news um, as part of climate change AI that tries to really harness AI's positive potential to fight climate change. And we've been around for a couple of years now, um, and I truly believe in, in, in the good. So I'll start, I'll start with the good. So um, the, the story starts actually um, from a, a personal perspective. Now, um, I had a crisis. Um, I was working in applied AI, and I was like, I care about climate change so much, I should just quit my job and go plant trees. Um, actually, what I really wanted to do was volunteer in schools and teach kids how to compost. That was going to be my thing. And then my partner was like, well, well maybe you have a PhD and you can actually like use that some 10 years of university studies for a reason. And, and, um, and, and it's true. And so I actually started digging and I, I met a bunch of people who had the same, um, I guess, like the same passion as I did for the climate, but wanted to continue using AI. So uh, David Rolnick, who's actually a professor at McGill now too, came together, there's almost 20 of us, and we wrote this paper, it's 100 pages, uh, but it's really, it, it meant to be really a catalyst for action. So these are all the ways in which AI can help fight climate change. And um, part of the work that we did was really making, we called it like a menu, showing people that, well, or your thing is time series analysis or transfer learning, and you are particularly passionate about, um, say, farms and forests or, or transportation, right? Well, there are lots of ways in which these two intersect. And the idea was really to help people take what they've learned and harness it in a way. Uh, because, for example, in the IPCC, there's always breakdowns, though, when they um, typically report uh, the greenhouse gases every year, they'll have, a, like, for example, farm, farms and forest transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And so we were like, let's let's cross the two together and, and help ML, ML folks understand how electricity works, so for example, electricity grids and help electricity systems can harness uh, ML. And we've been working um, on these different uh, aspects in the last in the last years. And um, the way I really like to see it, I mean, this is definitely a, a bird's eye view, but the way I um, I like to kind of see it in my, in my mind when I when I talk to people from these different everything from the micro to the macroscopic level and in between. And so um, especially since AI is really dependent on data, there's different data sources at these different levels that can be used for um, for different applications. And so I'll walk you through a couple of them today. Um, there's there's a lot more, but uh, just to give you a, a taste for, for what can be done. So for example, and we also try to, as part of our work, we also try to um, identify high leverage and high risk things because of course, there's a lot of things that we can do and we should be doing uh, to fight climate change, but there are certain things that have more or less certain impacts. Uh, so for example, um, people talk about ge solar geoengineering a lot and uh, solar geoengineering, um, so uh, let's say engineering our atmosphere, our atmospheric system in order to reflect more, for example, of the solar rays. And so, um, you know, the ozone layer protects us, but to certain, some extent it's suffering and with a that are melting, there's less and less ref reflect trapped. And then there's the greenhouse effect and it gets hot, you know, in a nutshell, uh, it's more complex than that. But so people have essentially been uh, proposing ways of 
you know, sciencing our way out of this situation, but it's far from a certain uh, effect, right? Because so say you spray a bunch of aerosols in the atmosphere, maybe they will affect the sun, but they will also, you know, stop stop um, rain from falling in a certain region or uh, conversely make it rain a lot in a certain region and farm. And so all of these things have, you know, potentially high leverage to, to get us out of this of the problem that we're in, but with a really high uncertainty. And so um, talk through these things, explain these things so that people, you know, didn't just kind of jump headfirst into, into whatever um, cool sounding tech that they, they, they thought was, was interesting. Um, so starting with the micro, um, as we're transitioning um, renewable energy, batteries are going to be really, really important um, as much for electric cars, but also for, for example, um, solar panels. What happens if there's no sun? You need a really, really big battery. And actually, um, one of the biggest impediments to transitioning to renewable energy is this variability. So, for example, if you have a diesel generator, you put diesel in it and you switch it on predictable amount of energy. And that's why people tend to like to use them because you know exactly how much you're going to get and how much diesel you need. If you have a solar panel or a solar farm, um, you need to be constantly aware of the of the uh, of the weather patterns of the, you know, of the climate. And, you know, you can't necessarily flip a and so you need a lot of batteries. And so um, uh, discovering new types of batteries, like going above and beyond the lithium that we, we use currently is gonna be really, really important. And so um, AI can help design new, like propose new compounds, essentially of batteries that can, and, um, you know, created in line. For example, um, we tend to kind of explore very, um, the way that researchers usually do this is they'll, you know, look at the properties of the elements. They'll be like, oh, wait, this one and this one should work together based on their properties. Well, AI can kind of think uh, or, or, or explore different opportunities outside the, like outside the ball. There's been a lot of work um, in pair with, uh, for example, like labs that actually synthesize these molecules in order to test their um, conduction properties, in order to test how much how much of a charge they hold. And we are st starting to see really promising results of completely new compounds that never existed before, but that can be an alternative to to the lithium batteries that we and like for example, be uh, will hold a charge longer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really um, on a very microscopic level, it's really uh, promising. At the meso level, um, two of my favorite applications are tracking deforestation and monitoring biodiversity. Um, so this is a startup out of uh, the Bay. They take old cell phones and um, they put solar panels on them and they kind of put them in the jungle uh, so that they get the sun and they listen to the rainforest in real time. Um, and they use AI in order to do what they call bioacoustic monitoring. And so they listen to the sounds, they listen uh, to the rain and the and the monkeys and the parrots. But if they hear a truck or you know, a, a saw, for example, in a place that isn't supposed to be um, getting logged, they can uh, automatically trigger an alert and send a ranger there to check, you know, what's going on. And actually, deforestation is a major issue in, for example, the Amazon, because it's so big, and you can't possibly police the whole of the Amazon. And very lightweight solution, it, you know, it literally runs on the sun, and it uses AI to, to be this like smart alert system. And another uh, also very uh, lightweight solution to, to, um, to monitoring is is biodiversity monitoring. So there's where you know there's not necessarily it's understaffed. So you can't um, be um, looking at all the, for example, camera trap data from a uh, certain safari or or even once again in the rainforest. And really set up AI uh, enabled cameras to do this kind of um, constant monitoring. And so for example. Um, these images because um, there's a really cool project happening here in Quebec in um, insect monitoring and moth monitoring, especially in the great north of Quebec, where there's not necessarily the infrastructure that will that we would have in like urban centers. And they'll put these kind of um, uh, independent, like they'll they'll be solar powered devices, moths, and and track not only um, you know what kind of moths, but even they'll recognize individuals. Um, they'll see them coming back every night. You can even track patterns. You can track all sorts of things um, and then gather data in places where there is no data, essentially, for example, in, in the. So it's really interesting because we're starting to 
like the biodiversity as it's as it's dwindling, we're starting to have a, a better idea of of, of, um, of you know the extent of uh, different uh, species using AI. So that's kind of the the more meso level, and at a macro level. I mean, we rarely maybe think about this, but uh, we have so many satellites cir circling the Earth. Um, 21st GPS is, is one of the applications that, which we all probably use, but um, there's actually uh, LIDAR satellites, there's infrared satellites, there's you know, photographs and videos. And so they gather all this data that, um, of course, for AI is, is a treasure trove. And so there's some really, really interesting remote sensing applications of AI that use this, this kind of really macro data to, um, to do some pretty cool stuff. So for example, um, detecting emissions. So for example, typically if you have a factory, um, depending on where, where region of the factory, kind of um, emissions are our factory emits, you know, this many megatons of, of CO2 or whatever other, other greenhouse gases. Um, but in a lot of regions of the world, that's not available, um, or also sometimes there's dubious accounting. <laughs> and so with AI, actually with infrared satellite imagery, you can um, detect these, also see the types of gases, you know, see how much and, and estimate um, the, the, the scope of the emissions, uh, just using satellite data with like no, no people um, on premise. And also something that's, that's pretty interesting is um, methane leaks. So methane is a greenhouse gas that's 30 times more potent than, uh, than carbon dioxide. Um, it's off, it's uh, emitted not only by um, factories and, and, and things like that, but it's also emitted by landfills, for example. So there's a, there's a lot of landfills over there, around the world that have been covered up and then, you know, problem solves, quote unquote, but then we realize that they're leaking methane. And so uh, patching that up, uh, for example, I don't know if you called Frederick Bach, that's actually an old landfill, and they have these big uh, globes that um, siphon out the methane, and they use it for heating, for example. And so things like that, um, sometimes what they do is just set it on fire, because actually setting methane on fire will um, remove, I mean, will will separate the, the particles of CO2 from other ones, and it's kind of the low-tech solution, let's say. Um, and also uh, in swamps and uh, and also just like natural sources of methane also occur, occur, but it's really good to know where they are. And so there's different ways and um, this could be useful and satellite imagery is, is, is a huge part of that. And another thing uh, that I particularly find is coral reef monitoring, because we know that coral reefs are, are highly impacted by, by climate change, but once again, it'll take uh, people diving in, for example, Australia and taking pictures, and then you have to look at the pictures and count the corals, but you can actually do this from space. And so people have been actually monitoring coral reefs um, and also get getting data over time, like uh, with El Nino, with different weather patterns, how the corals react, and hopefully um, help save them to a certain extent. Um, a recent project I worked on uh, was pretty interesting with, with David Rolnick. Um, it was, uh, we looked at this data set called ImageNet. Um, it's kind of a, a very uh, emblematic. And everyone uses ImageNet uh, because it's like one of the biggest data sets and people train models on it. And um, typically what they'll do, they'll train a model on ImageNet and then they'll uh, fine tune it. So tweak it for another uh, downstream application. And so we looked at ImageNet and it actually turns out that there are so many images of uh, animals of, of like living, creatures in ImageNet that people just don't seem to look like worry about because it's not humans. People tend to care about humans and not care about, you know, amphibians or invertebrates. So what we did is um, we actually looked at these images and we asked domain experts um, if, if each of these taxonomic groups image got like several people to look at it and they actually um, told us whether it was uh, the right species, whether you know it was possible to identify the species at all, whether the class made sense, some of the classes were kind of wonky. And then we, we parsed all this data and we found that some of the categories were actually 98% incorrect. And these are, you know, I don't know, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of times by black-footed ferrets, 98% of the images were completely false. Same thing with, you know, rock crabs and green lizard. And it's, and it's really interesting, like, for some of the classes, like reptiles, for example, a quarter of all of the images were incorrect. Um, feedback saying like these categories don't even make sense. Like this is not an actual thing. Like this is just like, for example, there was um, a tusker, which is technically an, an, um, an elephant with tusks, but it's not like, it's a temporary category, right? An elephant, a young elephant won't have tusks, then an old elephant can lose its tusks. So it's not really like a, a category that makes sense in the, in the bio 
there's a, there's categories like that. And then there was the images themselves, a lot of them that were just straight up wrong. And what we saw as well, um, and I think that we were the first people to look at this, is that we found a lot of evidence of geographical bias. So this data set was created in North America, and even the categories that were chosen were very kind of North So um, wait, the plot here shows true biodiversity. So for example, for birds, um, of course, there's more biodiversity, for example, in Central and South America, in Asia, um, compared to Europe. Europe has relatively little um, biodiversity in terms of birds. But in the in the actual data set in ImageNet, it was in uh, the United States were overrepresented compared to other regions. And it shows that, you know, even in the in the case of, of data sets that you know, have these geographical um, like they're 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 intrinsically geographical, right? Because these birds only live in specific regions. Um, that we found that there was even like this bias. Um, and also in the in the choice of categories, what was interesting is like, for example, the only insect that has its own category was the monarch butterfly. And so that's a cultural bias because monarch butterflies are kind of uh, emblematic butterflies in to you know care about them and and um, recognize them more so. But for example, you know. Uh, people don't care about it. And, and there were, you know, there are something like, you know, 6 million types of uh, insects, species of insects worldwide, but there was only something like 18 of them in ImageNet because, you know, people don't care about insects. And for, um, there was also contextual bias. So for example, all of, almost all of the fish images had people holding them. And a lot of the wild mammals images had people who had killed them on the images. And so like, for example, um, things like zebra and like all the, the big game animals, even elephant. And there was a lot of images of people who had to like just killed this elephant and posing with it. And so that was like, I mean, imagine that these images are, of a, this is a, a heart beast, I think. And, but actually it has three human beings and a gun, right? And so what does this, um, what's the effect that this can have on uh, models that are trained on this data? Uh, it, images when just looking through them, they all had, mostly men holding the holding the fish and so that all um, impact on this on these models and also there was a lot of like really weird images like this uh I don't even know what this is but it was like dressed up with a it was like a mammal with a dress and, and these little wings <laughs> like you know and then there was a stuffed animal and then there was like a very blurry goldfish so there's a lot of just also nonsensical images um and if you look, uh, it's one of the most popular uh, data sets in AI is, is ImageNet, and it's being used um, because it's, it's considered the gold standard of AI data sets because it was it was labeled by human beings, right? But the human beings that were labeling uh, ImageNet didn't necessarily have these, um, I guess, relatively specific um, knowledge about biology, uh, about entomology that would have been necessary uh, in order to really create this kind of data set. And so also we, we, what we can um, infer is that if you uh, evaluate your model only 98% accuracy, well, it's not really reflective of, you know, true, the true, uh, many of these categories are just don't make, don't make much, much sense. And if we look a little bit broader, um, you know, even when uh, there are, like, even when the natural world is reflected in ImageNet, so you can say like, well, actually there's 300 categories that or sorry, animals and, and which is which could be considered a good thing, but actually the way that these data sets are curated actually are heavily biased and annotated with that relevant expertise. So actually this data isn't um, as gold standard as as we think. So this is kind of ongoing work. I'm I'm actually particularly interested in data sets and um, the biases, how they're used, especially an image uh, a data set like ImageNet because it's like. It's like literally the cult data set of, of AI. And so um, I'm still doing ongoing work to see how it evolves, how people essentially present it as this like, <laughs> this fountain of knowledge uh, in AI. So um, the flip side, right? Um, in terms of AI's cost to the planet. Um, so actually when I started working on the paper with David and and, um, and the, the other folks that wrote it, um, uh, reached out to me and said, well, have you thought about your, I have to admit that even I was like, about AI, you know, it's, it's ephemeral, it's ethereal, there's no, there's no cost to the planet for all this. But then um, this article came out in June 2019, that showed that training a single AI model can emit as much carbon as five cars in their lifetimes. And that's when I was really like, oh, okay, so like my work actually has an impact. 
since I'm, I'm very kind of trying, I'm, I try to be really empirical. I was like, okay, I want to understand this more. And I thought it would kind of be like a one shot deal that I figure out some kind of formula or some kind of, you know, magical um, to estimating AI, the carbon footprint of AI, but it's actually been um, five. The, it's still an ongoing process. And so, so from this paper, what they did is they, they took a, a large language model, maybe uh, that's how we call them nowadays. Um, and um, essentially, it's not only training the model, but also uh, exploring the different um, architectural uh, choices of the model. They um, comparing this, I think it was 626,000 pounds of CO2 comparing to, you know, a round trip flight, a human life in a US, US car, including fuel. And um, since then, we've um, there's been other models. So, so this this the study was in 2019, but still, since then, we've had, for example, the GPT models. We've had models, and honestly, the the carbon footprint it has been pretty comparable. 100 tons of CO2. So that's 500,000 kilograms and this is in pounds, but it, it's pretty similar in terms of in, in terms of carbon footprint. Um, and so, yeah, so one ton of CO2 is is roughly one transatlantic flight. So these are pretty big numbers, right? But what I was particularly interested in was understanding them and understanding what what steps we can take in order to reduce them. Um, you know, as we know, like reduce, reuse, recycle. Can you do something like that for um, for AI? Um, in order to figure that out, we have to take how this, these numbers are calculated. So typically, you have any. Anytime you plug something into a, a power outlet anywhere in the world, you have a carbon intensity. But that depends on how electricity is generated. And so, for example, here in Montreal, we're really lucky in Quebec, we have hydroelectricity. So our um, carbon intensity is, is very low. It's not, there's still the, the carbon uh, that was emitted by creating these infrastructures by building dams, essentially. So it's, it's but it's around 20 grams. And in, um, in a place that's 100% coal based, it's going to be around 800 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So you take that number. And so this is kind of the ongoing cost, right? The, the, the cost from using this electricity. This is Ontario, for example. Then you multiply that by whatever your hardware uses, whatever energy uh, is used, uh, for example, uh, for training an AI model. And now, I guess when I started this work, usually you use like one, one GPU, like one kind of computing chip, use a thousand of them at the same time, but so which uses a lot of energy. So you multiply that energy by um, the carbon that, that is used for, um, for generating it, that's emitted by generating it, and you have the time, right? And so typically that's like the three criteria for, um, you multiply the three, you have, for example, 124 grams hour times you know four million kilowatt hours times the time and you have your 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 final number and so actually one of the first projects I worked on that um is actually still maintained and still uh, evolving and, and used um is code carbon which essentially it's um a little program that runs whatever for example AI code you're running but not necessarily only AI it can be any kind of Python code and at the end it will give you um, an estimate of how much uh, energy you used and also what that corresponds to. And I think that this last point is really important because when you say 626,000 pounds of CO2, it can be very, but if you tell them, well, that's like 50 days of watching TV or, you know, 300 miles driving, driving in a car, that becomes a lot more uh, concrete. And so this is a, a project that now is, you know, it's, it's kind of grown I think it's something like 100,000 downloads a month. It's, it's actually getting quite big and people are reporting there, um, which is pretty huge. Um, but in the meantime, I've, con I've continued my, my, my research. And one of the most um, recent projects I, I worked on that, like a paper came out in December, um, was about AI deployment. Because um, if you think about the, the life cycle, right, um, there's the an approach called life cycle analysis. And it try, it tries to think about any kind of object, any kind of thing from the cradle to the grave. And so essentially you'll start with extracting raw materials, manufacturing, like for example, for a tote bag or a pair of jeans, it's, it's usually more concrete. So, you know, you have the actual cotton that needs to be grown, the water that's used, the transportation cost of bringing this cotton and processing it and making fabric out of it, right? Um, for example, in the case of AI, you've got the, the equipment for, for training an AI model, you need a lot of GPUs. And so you've got the energy and the, and the rare earth metals and all that that's 
and goes into this equipment manufacturing. And then, for example, you train the model, which is where most of the information was. But once the model has been trained, it doesn't just sit there on a computer. It essentially gets vaulted out into the into the universe and then gets used um, by, by people, right? And then typically you think about disposal end of life. What does that look like? It's hard to say, maybe it just like languishes on a on a hardware on a hard drive somewhere. But in any case, these three steps of equipment manufacturing, model training, and model development are really important because essentially they're the three most like energy intensive and carbon intensive phases of any of any AI model. And so I I work science. This was um 2022, 2023, where we trained a model called Bloom. And um we, we decided to go above and beyond model training and to look at, okay, well, what if we think about the broader life cycle? And what we discovered is was really uh, pretty um, pretty surprising that actually equipment manufacturing, the hardware for training bloom was 22% of the overall carbon footprint. Um, the overhead of uh, networking and storage and, you know, when you think about a server, um, it's it actually has a lot of different components. And so we tend to focus only on, so this is like the 49%, but actually there's 30% that, um, you know, all of the internet, all of the AC, all of the storage and transfer and all of that actually does add up um, quite a lot. And then when you think about deployment, what we did is we deployed the blue model um, and uh, used by by user user queries and honestly uh, everyone was pretty surprised to what extent like when a lot of people were querying the model a lot of people were asking it questions the and uh, the gpu power usage spiked because you had like all these like calculations going on and essentially it was it was it was consuming a, a huge amount of energy and just did a case study we just uh, deployed it for i think three weeks and then we measured the energy but um i was really captivated by this Thing that we don't really um we're not really aware of uh because like even every time that you know uh you use google maps that's going to be an ai model every time you you time you you know ask a question of a smart assistant every time you turn on a light bulb all of that ai use um you know it really does add up but and yet we don't have any transparency about how much energy um is being used because it's never on premise right when we use google maps or, or on Google here, just, just an example. But when we use this uh, AI enabled um, tool, the, the model is running somewhere that's far away from us. And so we tend not to have any transparency because you know even if you do monitor your home energy usage and you can see, oh, I installed smart light bulbs and it's saving me what month because uh, I get to turn or like they turn off automatically or, or whatnot, but you don't have the rest of the of the equation, right? Because you don't know where the model is running. You don't know how much energy it's using. And so I was really kind of kind of really obsessed with getting a better idea of, of AI deployment. And so what I did uh, with some people uh, who wrote the original um, the, the paper I cited at the very beginning. Um, so this this the this uh, paper in 2019 was uh, authored by Emma Shrubel. And so I, I reached out to her and I was like, so you wrote this paper in 2019. Do you want to kind of do a follow up about. And so we worked together on um, this recent study. And what we did is we took 10 common tasks that uh, people use AI for things like answering questions, classifying text, um, generating images, captioning images. So 10 kind of relatively popular tasks. We took three data kind of scope. Um, we we took 80 models that were trained for specific tasks, um, and we took uh, eight models that uh, were general models. So to take a step back, in um, in recent years, we've really seen a pivot in AI from, for example, uh, I have movie reviews, and I want to classify movie reviews into positive neutral and negative. So this is kind of like a, a really common task in applied AI. It could be it could be product reviews or movie reviews or any kind of like restaurant reviews. And so typically you'll be like, okay, I'll train a model on this data set that I have. And, it's, and for example, you know, this product sucks, one star, this product is awesome, five stars. And you train a model that's doing that, only that task, it can't do any other tasks. So this is what we call task specific models. In recent years, we have um, shifted, pivoted to general purpose models. So that means, you know, you have 
um, and it's able to categorize, but it's also able to, um, you know, write you a sonnet and generate a cookie recipe. And it's supposed to be, you know, universal, quote unquote. Um, I think the the more the more formal term is zero shot model. So models that aren't necessarily trained for a specific task, but can do any. So the story goes. So we looked at eight popular zero shot models, and we ran each one for a thousand uh, data points and we, ten times. So it was actually pretty a pretty big. Um, we ran a lot of experiments, um, and what we found is that there's a really big range of emissions. So depending on the task, so for example, classifying text, you really. Um, energy efficient, generating images, it uses the most energy. And um, like essentially there's a whole spectrum between this is this is in uh, grams of CO2, but it's um, it's logarithmic. So it's actually like, that's a really, really big difference. So like text classification will be around two grams and then like up to a thousand grams of CO2 per a thousand inferences, like a thousand images generated. So it was a really, really big, uh, uh, spectrum, a really, really big range of uh, of emissions, of energy usage as well. Um, and we, what we found is that modality was actually a really big thing. So modality, so text played a really big role. So what we can see is that the text-based, so like the blue, the red, and the green ones are, um, the, the, the blue and the red ones, uh, you, you see a really, really big difference if you're like classifying text. So for example, text to category, so like positive, negative movie reviews versus, you know, picture of a cat and a really, really big difference of, of emissions. Um, so anything with images was, was relatively um, intensive, but um, classification tasks were, were relatively um, low energy. And um, we did a, a pretty a pretty specific calculation because when you have they're like, well, training is, is such a big amount of energy, such a big amount of carbon that when you deploy it, it, it's really such a small amount that it doesn't really matter. We don't even actually have to like calculate this stuff because it's such a, because it's like, you know, people have a, have devices where you can run, you know, a, a language model, for example. So what we did is we actually calculated the um, inferences. So how many, like, for example, queries uh, would it take for a language model to add up to the training uh, carbon cost? And so the depending on the size of the model, so like the smallest model was 500 million um, parameters connections to 7 billion connections. And uh, so the number of inferences is to 600 million. But to put that into perspective, I think that ChatGPT has something like 10 million user queries a day, uh, or at its peak had that many. So that means that in 20 days, you, you've reached uh, the emissions from training just by deploying a model. And um, as we're deploying the, or in, you know, everything and anything, you know, now, nowadays people will talk to ChatGPT for, you know, validating pretty much, I don't know, people ask it to tell knock-knock jokes, right? And every time, every time we do that, every time we, we, um, we use a model or we, for example, someone was like, oh, I don't actually print out uh, coloring learning books for my daughter anymore. I just ask a GPT to generate them for me. Well, every time we do that, every time we query a, a model, a language model, it does come with a cost and that really adds up. And so, of course, these are not representative of all use cases, but it still gives us a, a pretty good range. So, um, so for example, in 20 model, that's a popular language model, we reach the same amount of carbon as, as, was, as uh, was emitted during training. Um, this is kind of like an inside joke. Um, so the thing is, is that we really don't know much about a lot of um, like proprietary AI models, including ChatGPT or, or any of these kind of like really popular ones. And so uh, at some point, someone referred to it as three raccoons in a trench coat. And that's been like the, the, the ongoing metaphor. So closed, closed uh, proprietary AI models are, are raccoons in a trench coat, but we don't really know what's going on. So of course, the results that we have are dependent on the hardware that we use as more GPUs, but we still don't have any any of this information. And so um, people, you know, have this have this uh, idea that every time we use ChatGPT, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's just a technology. But if we, if they started to see how much CO2 was emitted, like say it's even just 20 grams of CO2 or something small, but every time we add up. And so we don't know much about these proprietary models, but we do know that um, switching from these good old fashioned uh, uh, task specific models to generative models comes with a cost to the environment. And so like essentially, uh, if you look at this plot, you can see that from like the blue to the red, that's, you know, 
five grams of CO2 and a thousand grams of CO2. So that's a really big difference. And so as we're switching out um, these good old fashioned AI models that could only, for example, categorize movies, um, I don't know, fill in the block. Now we're switching them out more and more for generative models because we want to generate. Well, that comes with a really big cost. So what we found in our study, so say the old models were, you know, yeah, 0 0.5 grams of CO2, you switch them out and you're, you're generating like 10, 20, 30 times more carbon for the exact same thing, right? You're still, you're still uh, categorizing product reviews. You're still, you know, finding information on the internet. Um, I don't know, uh, now they even want to put uh, generative AI in navigation. So you're still navigating from point A to point B, but you're using a much more resource, resource intensive tool to do it. And that comes with a cost that we're not, um, that we don't have any transparency about. And so I think that uh, for me, the takeaway of the study was not so much, but more that we really need to communicate the environmental impacts, both to users of models, but also to model developers, because even in the AI community, people um, don't necessarily have a good idea of the environmental impacts of their work. Um, so just uh, last couple of minutes, uh, what can we, um, last four or five years of my life has been revolving around this question because I'm definitely, uh, optimistic about AI, but I do see more and more of its harms or impacts to the environment, especially, but also to society at large. And so I try to grapple with this a lot. Like, my work as being just too critical. So I'm, I'm definitely not saying that we should all, you know, stop doing tech and, you know, go, I don't know, go live on a farm, although that does seem pretty <laughs> appealing most days. But I do think that there are things that we can do that kind of trade off the costs and the benefits. So um, our technological fixes, things like geoengineering that can be seen as, as, as ways to, to help, you know, harness AI, um, for sustainability, for fighting climate change, but you know it's really important to understand the consequences of these fixes. So it might seem to be like a no-brainer. Of course, we're just going to reflect the sun back, but the uh, the broader impacts of these things. And so um, when we have increased transparency, we can really increased understanding and increased transparency. We can really trade off costs and benefits. And so I see it as you know nowadays we have we have more information. So we know, for example. Um, I don't know, I want to go to library. I know that my choices can be, you know, uh, take a bike, I can walk, I can take the bus or I can take a car. And I know more or less what are the costs and uh, like the environmental impacts of each one of these kind of transportation uh, choices. Well, I see the same thing that like, would be useful for AI, you know, given that I need to, um, a tool that will find information on the internet, right? Like assuming that that's what I want to do, there are different ways of getting there. And if I have more information about, you know, the energy cost of each one, then I can make an informed decision and say, okay, well, I'm going to um, extract information from the internet using this specific type of AI. Um, also, as we're in this pursuit of generality and universality and GPT and whatnot, but it, we saw we we saw that these smaller, um, more specific, more specialized models are really much more efficient. And uh, we also like I didn't really talk about the evaluation part, but we did also evaluate them, and we showed that as well. They you know they have the same accuracy, the same kind of um, performance as general generative models, but they're much more efficient. And I think the trade off here is. Um, you know, if you're doing a task that's a, a very well-defined task, for example, finding information on the internet, you don't need a general model because you don't joke and find information and generate an image. You need it to find information. So I think that for specific tasks, now people are using GPT because they think it's cool, uh, but th that comes with a very high cost in terms of energy. And so, you know, if, if people were a, bit, a little bit more reflective about, you know, we're making the switch to generative energy is going to cost or how many carbon emissions is going to generate, they can make, like, I mean, everyone's talking about ESG. When I talk to people who work in companies, they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, triple bottom line, you know, sustainability, blah, 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 social governance. But for AI, it seems to kind of elude all these different conversations because once again, people think it doesn't have an impact. You know, we planted a bunch of trees and, you know, everyone's, uh, you know, traveling less this year and, and whatnot. And then you're like, yeah, but you just switched to generative AI for all your products. And they're like, yeah, well, it's because it's, you know, it's in right now or whatnot. So I'd, I'd, I'd really rather we, we stayed with more efficient, smaller models for specific tasks. 
couple of working groups. And I know that there are uh, certifications that are being developed for green AI, which are, I mean, part of the puzzle, once again, not the whole puzzle, but, you know, just um, for people who do care about this, at least being like, okay, well, we're using this application. It's running on, for example, renewable as efficient as possible to have people, at least like people who, who use AI, who don't develop AI, it's good to have a certain signal, right? Like, um, you know, there's like a fair trade brand, there's an organic brand. Well, for AI, it could be like this green AI um, brand that, or certification that could at least help people make more informed choices because be an expert in sustainability. Um, but of course you can't te techno fix your way out of everything. And I think that one of the big things I learned with climate change AI is that, um, the most, the most impactful projects I've seen are those where AI is a part of the solution and a relatively small part majority of whatever project is going on is domain expertise. So for example, you know, someone's already doing something and coming from a place of knowledge and a, like a deep understanding of the domain. and then they use AI to make, you know, their data processing simpler or to gather some information that, that was, or, or something, but it's not, it's not about the AI, right? It's more about uh, yeah, tackling the whatever challenge using the information from the domain. And so I think that that's kind of the, the big take. You can't just be like, oh, I'm going to solve climate change by using AI indiscriminately. That's not a thing. It's, and actually, it, it turns out that AI people have a really bad reputation outside of AI. <laughs> and it, like, I, I've talked to people a lot and they're like, yeah, the AI people are like, oh, this thing you do, you can just use a, whatever, a GPT and it's going to solve everything. And I don't even know why you're doing it like that. And you guys have been doing it wrong. So um, changing that to something a little bit more humble and a little bit more like, okay, let me understand this. Let me see if AI is helpful at all, you know, because sometimes it's really not maybe there's not enough data, maybe um, it's a very complex issue that can't be reduced to, uh, there's there's so many cases where AI just is, is not the, the tech or is not the solution to be used. And I think that um, it's kind of like the, the main takeaway I've seen of the, of the climate positive work is like just the first step of figuring out whether AI is even in the picture is the most important one. And um, And of course, like something that change AI, it, that AI is, is definitely not the silver bullet. And even with all the work that we do, it's not going to solve the climate crisis because we need a lot more um, human solutions. We need a lot more um, nature-based solutions of which AI is, is, is only a very small part of. Um, oh yeah. And my, my last thing is, um, of course, innovation is important. This is like, I guess, something I usually present to more tech focus, like really tech, tech people, is that a broader uh, context of social environmental responsibility is really important um, when practicing AI because it's not just a technology. It's not like you're just, um, I don't know, creating a, a one specific thing. No, AI typically has multiple uses. And so when people create an AI tool, it's really important to think about, you know, even if you just made a hammer, maybe you can hammer in a nail, but maybe it can also break a hole in the wall and maybe someone can use it as a weapon, right? Um, and so it's really important to be thinking about this um, as um, like a context, like a framing. And so uh, a lot of the work I do is also to try to help people to think beyond a very narrow application of, of their work and to think about like the broader societal impacts. Thank you very much for your question. Okay, now we have... And we have time for Q&A. So people in the room, raise your hand or for people online, uh, Kit will read your question aloud. Uh, yeah, so we have time for that now. <laughs> uh, there's one question in the uh, Zoom. If you want to search that, I probably know what's using. Um, and it's from uh, Bing Klein who asked, what's energy cost between ChatGPT and Google search? So no, it's like, oh yeah, sorry. No, yeah. Do you want me to repeat your question? Yeah, you might as well. Okay, you yeah. So um, the question is whether there's a comparison of ChatGPT and Google search. So it's actually a really interesting question because both of them are like really black box tools and Google's never uh, dive in about like the energy cost of a Google search, even way back when. And so there's a lot of estimates. And so it's really hard to say. Um, but in the study that we did, we kind of used... I mean, similar technologies, given that all of this is proprietary, it's really hard to say like this is a similar technology, but 
being considered, we used we we uh, did a similar uh, comparison, and we found that there was a, a, about a thirty time different, uh, thirty times less energy used for like um. I want to say like a traditional Google search or, or information retrieval search. So like, for example, um, so to take a step back, uh, before on the internet, it's um, essentially these big, um, how to explain it? It's like almost like a huge database of, of, of the, all of the internet. And when you do a query, what the system tries to do is to find a similarity between what you asked and all of the internet. And there's different doing this. So there's like creating these vectors, like number representations of the text, like all sorts of ways this is being done. So um, that is is relatively efficient. Works just by um, like comparing numbers to numbers. So you have your 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 question that gets converted into a bunch of numbers, and you have all this text that gets converted to a bunch. Of that's, that's really efficient. When you use a generative tool like ChatGPT, essentially what it's doing is like. It's it's putting in your your words and it's trying to complete it's trying to generate more and more text in order to like complete your query essentially so instead of using existing numbers it's going to be like generating more you add a word you have to um, feed in the rest of the text so essentially like say you have two words then it becomes three words and it becomes four words and so the more you generate the more energy it takes because like you're feeding in more and more words to generate the end. And so what we found is that that's, that uses about 30 for the GPT, that's not exactly Google, but similar. <laughs> that was so clear. <laughs> well, it's like my first job was actually doing information retrieval. Uh, and it, it's like, it's crazy how efficient this stuff was. Like the way that it's stored and the way that it's retrieved, it's like, it's just like lightning fast actually takes a lot of like compute like it just it's even slow like just just to run i have a question but because i want to anyone have a question you yes uh, what is your personal feeling on the industry and what the industry is regarding the i feel that lately it's been very um very uh divided and so i think in the last year or so so chat came out in november 2022 so about since chat came out there's there's more and more fractions in ai now people are like so do you believe in existential risk so do you believe in um safety like even like words have changed their meaning anyway so i feel like there's a lot of that and i think that with climate it's the same like my work often gets perceived as oh you should you think we should just like give up ai and go live on a farm right and so um it's kind of listening to each other people are, are more like well you know do you I don't know, whatever. Do you care about climate change or not? Do you believe in existential risk or not? It's like, it's really binary. And we have all these like binary in fights going on. And um, yeah, it's really hard to to reach a consensus. Like even people who are working in AI, like law and policy, that copyright is a problem or not. Do you think we should, uh, I don't know, defend the rights of, of artists and creators or not, right? It's always like a binary thing. And, and it's really sad because it's like it, things lose their... Mm, they're uh, like like the details, right? It becomes like a black and white question where when it's not, it's not a black and white question. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, frustrating and very tiring as well because even even in places of discussion and debate, it's it's more um, not aggressive, but like it's 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 more like debated, right? Like before, you could go to a conference and just kind of have some conversations, you know, go out, out for a drink and like talk about stuff. Now it's like. I don't believe in AGI, we're not going to talk anymore, right? <laughs> like, cool. So yeah, and also the fact that um, Chad GPT, I guess, put AI on the broader um, radar, right? Like every time I meet a person now, they're like, oh, you work in AI. What do you think about Chad GPT? What do you think about existential risk? What do you think about whatever? And, and that's really frustrating. I mean, to kind of contextualize, like people don't realize that there's more to AI than Chad GPT, for example. And I spend most of my time being like, for example, for climate change, what's useful is not generative technology. It's things like that detect, you know, methane leaks on satellite imagery, and that's something that's existed for a while now, right? And 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 you know, yeah, fights <laughs> essentially. Well, probably yeah. on that, I'm wondering because you said a lot of times when you were originally kind of presenting some of this work, people said, "Well, we don't kind of have the numbers," and then that led you to do a lot of the really quantitative work. I'm wondering if as you're 
be of work too if people still are like well we want more numbers like are they still saying like, oh we just need more or are some people in the industry listening to what you're saying and saying like oh now we have the numbers let's adapt or adjust or so uh, yeah, they're still saying we need more numbers. The thing with um, deployment is that um, it's actually, it's really hard to study AI deployment because people do it in so many different ways. Like for example, AI model training typically is relatively straightforward. Like you have whatever, a thousand GPUs, you have three months of time. Like it's like, it's really like point A to point B and you can really quantify it. Whereas deployment, people tend to do all sorts of tip, like tricks to get the models to um, like, for example, like to scale, right? Like if you have one model and you have too much, too much demand, you, you, you clone the model and you make a second one. And there's like all sorts of things like that. And so when we did our study, people are like, oh, well, you know, you're only looking at one model at a time. You're only looking at one GPU. You weren't looking at scaling. You weren't looking at batching and queuing and all these things that people do. And it's true. And, and I think, I guess, more follow-up work is needed. But the thing is, is that you can't ever represent all the different ways in which people deploy AI. And so it's, it's kind of frustrating because on one hand, yeah, you can always get more numbers, but on the other hand, I feel like, and plus it's like, for example, the, the study came out and then like two days later, there was like a new uh, stable diffusion image generation model. And they're like, oh, you didn't study this in your paper. And you're like, no, cause it came out after the paper. But but so your, your work is outdated now cause you don't look at this like GPT turbo or whatever stable diffusion turbo model. And I'm like, no, cause it wasn't there yet. <laughs> you can't. Um, so yeah, also the speed of like Hugging Face, the company where I work at, we, I mean, has a, have a platform where people share AI models. And part of the work that we do is like, we try to evaluate the models. We try to, you know, do uh, model cards and, dis and disclaimers and um, identify like use cases that are unacceptable and stuff like that. But it's just, it's so fast. Like the models go so fast and there's like new modalities and new like use cases. And I feel like it's always like, you're always trying to catch up. You're never really... Um, yeah, you're always like chasing after this thing and then it just mutates and then you're like, okay, now I'm chasing after this other thing. Like, so yeah, it's whack-a-mole. Wow. Wow. I forgot my auto zoom. <laughs> uh, move, move there. Um, and that's so fascinating. And I love talking things specifically for that. It's like so useful uh, seeing all these details in the plots. It's good work. Thank you. It's really hard to keep up on. It is. Uh, so there's an anonymous attendee who is asking, um, how can we incorporate this aspect within AI literacy discussion? I think this is very relevant to think about as a part of a future skill set young generations will need and the ability to understand trade-offs. Are there good resources to raise public awareness on this issue? So resources to raise public awareness around the environmental impacts of AI. Um, yes and no. I feel like we haven't hit the point where... Um, like for example, what my, my 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 dream would be like energy star ratings for AI. So we, we're not quite there yet. And when I talk to policymakers about this, they essentially say, well, we don't have enough information in order to make that kind of energy star rating because like it would be, you know, depending contingent upon the type of AI tool and like what you're using it for and blah, blah, blah. And so I think that currently we don't have a, a good like way of communicating the information. Like I guess we could start just by do by mandating just like say how much energy is used for a query. And even if that's not very um, informative to like your average person, at least it's going to be like a, a number, right? And that's somewhere to start with. And so that's what I've been pushing for. Like even in the, all of these um, AI acts and executive orders and, and whatnot, none of them have anything about environmental impacts. And so I'm like, okay, can we just start with like, you know, mandating, uh, I don't know, bias testing or whatever else they already have in there and, and adding energy uh, measurements, because it seems like a relatively uh, straightforward thing to do. And then once we have them, we can start, you know, creating a, a spectrum. Like this is an A plus model and this is like a D minus model. And then like, uh, hopefully, eventually we're going to start to have like a better like ranking. But I guess currently we we have in model cards, actually, we have some information for carbon footprint of training, but not deployment because deployment is, is honestly like you can do so much with a model that you can't like even say I make a, I train a model and then I'll, I'll test it locally and I'll be like, oh, it's like, you know, 100 kilowatt hours or whatever. Um, if someone uses it on a different like in a different setup, uh, if they use like scaling, for example, and they'll constantly have like the powering up, powering down situation that can like double or triple the energy usage. So it's really hard to have like a single number and which just makes it pretty frustrating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's also another question uh, from Carolina who asks, uh, how hard is it 
to collect it across the value chain? Are there data sharing agreements that you've found trying to deal with that since you might have many actors providing services across a value chain to an end actor? So gathering information across the value chain about the environmental footprint of AI has been really, really hard. Um, so actually something that I'm, I struggle with, like I literally feel like I'm uh, Don Quixote in the, with the windmills is the, is the embodied emissions of manufacturing uh, the GPUs because literally um, there's a single company that makes pretty much like, you know, 99% of the GPUs that are used for training AI models, NVIDIA. And there's one single place like factory that makes them uh, based out of Taiwan. Um, and yet there's no numbers. And every time I ask for a number, it's like, oh, well, it's a such a complex supply chain. Oh, there's so many moving parts. Oh, it's so complicated. And, and I, um, for example, for the Bloom paper, when we did our estimates of the embodied emissions, we had to use like proxies essentially saying that, well, the density of a GPU chip is this much and it has this many transistors. So we can estimate that the embodied emissions are this, but it's, it was such a high, like it was just like a very, very high level um, estimate of the actual thing. So that's something that I've struggled with. And it's been like three years now that I have zero, zero progress around that, frustratingly. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. I was just wondering if there was any, um, I guess kind of like, recent or upcoming uh, stuff at like the macro level of the analysis you're talking about because we see at least in like with deep minds um, like alpha flow and stuff there's a lot of stuff on like the micro and the mm -hmm. sort of the data role in their context kind of like the meso level of just you don't really see a lot of macro? stuff yeah, like Actually, yeah. IBM. Uh, so yeah, sorry. The, um, the question was whether there's some macro level initiatives with like satellite imagery and stuff like that. Um, IBM and NASA recently re released a really big data set with uh, satellite imagery and climate data. And I think what they're trying to do, they called it foundation model, which bothers me. But I think what they're trying to do <laughs> is, is really uh, uh, enable people to use this data. Because essentially, if you wanted to use satellite imagery yourself, it's, it's actually really hard because it's got the uh, the Jeep, like the coordinate component that people don't really know how to deal with usually in AI. So for example, you know, you have images, you have text. Well, with satellite imagery is that you have images, but that are linked to geospatial coordinates. And you have to take that into account when you're working with satellite imagery. And so like people usually get stuck at that first stage because they don't like know how to work with it. It's like, it's a special kind of file and you use a special kind of software to use it. And so I think what IBM and NASA tried to do was, was, was create a data set that was much more um, usable for your average machine learning person, which is really, which is really great. Um, and I think they even did like a challenge for, I think it was like, I think it was tracking extreme weather events. I think that's what they were, that they were doing, um, which is really interesting because extreme, like, so usually when you do climate prediction, you can either do like, uh, local climate prediction, but if you want to do like tracking a hurricane or something, you need you need to look at like um, so you need to look across time and across space, and that's like a really hard problem for for AI. And so, I mean, they're doing they're doing great work, um, but I think that like for your average person, it's still like a really big endeavor essentially because it's just so much data. Yeah. There is one online. Yeah. Uh, oh. Um, are AI energy disclosure requirements for organizations a welcome step for public policy on this issue? Uh, what are the pushback arguments against this? Well, the pushback argument is is uh, corporate secret, I think. Like even in the last year or like year and a half, um, like before when a, a new AI model would come out, I could read the paper and at least see you know, ballpark how many hours of compute they used, ballpark how big the model was, like they, there was a certain amount of detail that was disclosed. But since ChatGPT came out, there had been like zero, there's been zero transparency. And even if you look at places like Google, which were actually, and Google research was actually pretty transparent. Um, if you compare like papers that were published in 2021 versus 2023, they don't share anything anymore. Like they completely crack down on any kind of, like they don't even say how big the model is. They don't even say, how many like GPU hours, they, like nothing, not the data, not, because I think that on one hand, they're really afraid of um, whatever people stealing their ideas. Like I've definitely heard people from like, well, Google or Microsoft or whatever say, well, the reason that OpenAI had the success was because they took a lot of the research that was being done and kind of like built upon it in house and then made a, a product, but without actually like divulging any information about the product, which is true. 
Uh, I mean, to a certain extent, like uh, there, we don't know, for example, what's under the hood of ChatGPT. Um, and then the other thing is that I think that now companies are more and more afraid of like liability issues. So for example, if you say what data you used to train your model, someone can look through that data and find copyright, right? Or or like, for example, CSAM or, or something like that. And so now companies are just like, I'm not going to say anything about anything because that way you, you know, you can't sue me or you can't criticize me. And so I think that with energy ratings, it's the same. It's like, well, if I tell you how much energy ChatGPT uses, maybe you can try to reverse engineer how big it is or what hardware we're using or whatever. Um, and then, you know, that's whatever, the secret sauce, <laughs> secret recipe. Yeah. So it's really frustrating because like I used to have this like spreadsheet where every time I see a model, I try to like note like the key characteristics of the model and, and keep track of you know, just like estimates, my own estimates of like how much energy people are using. But since a year, I haven't been able to populate like that, that spreadsheet very much because people just don't share anything. Go ahead. <laughs> Any other in-room questions? There is a uh, last question here uh, from uh, Laurent. It says, hi, Tasha, great work. Um, on the field, I'm wondering what we can do better right now. As a small company aiming to implement AI solutions in many industries and willing to be as responsible as possible, what would be the best ways uh, to follow? Uh, should we wait for ISO green AI certifications? Should we use a gross emission estimate and propose carbon compensation for clients? Have you any link, reference, or groups that would be interesting on that subject? Thank you. So the question being best practices that we can do now. Um, the Green Software Foundation is doing some really cool work. That's the thing, like ISO certification takes a really long time because they're really... I mean, it's kind of their thing is like standards. And so they're really like specific about stuff. And I feel that for generative AI, there's like a lot of missing information that is making it hard to actually have like an ISO like right now. But the Green Software Foundation does have some um, some great resources. I think that, I mean, maybe practically speaking, the one thing that we can really do right now is transparency. So either as a, a provider or as a user of technology, like for example, when we were doing the Bloom study, we asked, like we were using a, a, a public compute cluster in France and we asked them for like all the possible information that we could get, like energy consumption, um, information about the, the hardware and how much like energy was used for like the network. And like, we asked them like, um, you know, everything like overhead, uh, heating and cooling. Like we asked them like all the information we could possibly get. And sometimes they didn't have it and they asked to ask their suppliers and whatnot. But still like at the end of the day, we had all the information we could, like almost all the information we could possibly want in order to have a better idea of the of the life cycle uh, assessment of Bloom, and I think that it could be something similar. Like if you're using I don't know, whatever Azure infrastructure, you can ask them like, what is the carbon intensity of the energy that I'm that I'm using to power whatever product I'm using, or uh, you know like what's the efficiency or what's the water usage? Like I didn't talk about water usage much, but like you can actually, I think as a tech user, especially as a company, you do have a certain amount, you have the right to a certain amount of transparency. And I think that people underestimate to what extent they can they can like require it. Maybe as a user, like even as a user though, like I'm, I'm sure if enough people push back at Google uh, or, or OpenAI or whoever, like they would be more transparent about it. And actually like, most, like I recently was reading about a collective action um, that a city in Oregon, um, they actually sued for a Freedom of Information Act. Uh, they, they sued Google to get information of the water usage of the server that they built in their city. And they found that the server was using 25% of, this, of the town's consumption, water consumption uh, of a town of like several hundred thousand people. And because of this freedom of information lawsuit, Google then published the numbers for all of the data centers in the States. So, I mean, stuff like that, I mean, it is, it was, it took a certain amount of time, but you know, there was pushback and, and it, it did give some, um, some amount of transparency. So it gives me hope. <laughs> Are there any other questions? That first time? No. Okay, well, I guess uh, we're good for today. Thank you so much, Sasha, for speaking. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our captioner, Sarah. Thank you, Kit, for helping with the tech. And uh, we encourage you to come to our future events. If you had friends who want to come, we put the links online of the video recordings so people can reference them again. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you.